Good evening, and welcome to our worship service tonight. What a joy it has been to worship the Christ child, to see the baby in the manger, to, to watch as, as Simeon took the child in his arms, and praise God for the privilege of seeing and, and holding that little child. But he isn't just a baby. Jesus Christ came into this world to become your Savior and mine. And we'll discover that in our worship service this evening. The order of service is printed on the screens for you tonight. We'll begin this evening with the singing of our first hymn, hymn 65, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Listen as the soloist sings. Please stand. God our Father, each day is a gift of your grace. Your mercies are new every morning. Guide our steps by the light of your word. Shield us from harm and keep us from evil. Better than life is your love. Put joy in our hearts and praise in our lips. Alleluia. Let us now confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. 
I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. As we take a look at the child who was born for us, Jesus Christ, we recognize that people are divided because of him. Some recognize him as their Lord and Savior, as we do. Others don't know what to make of him. Others simply reject him. Our first lesson comes from the book of Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 through the first part of verse A. And here Micah talks about his lowliness, the lowliness of his birth in a small, lowly town, Bethlehem. That is an offense to some. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. This is the word of our God. Let's join now in reading responsively the words of Psalm 148. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord from the earth, lightning and hail stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all rulers on earth, young men, maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Today's second lesson comes from the book of Hebrews in chapter 2, where the writer to the Hebrews again emphasizes the lowliness of Jesus Christ. And while his lowliness is an offense to some and a stumbling block to them, to their faith, his lowliness is also a comfort to us. He understands what it's like to be human. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. 
In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of our God. Alleluia, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Alleluia. Please stand now for the gospel. The Holy Gospel for this evening is recorded in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 7, verses 40 through 43. Jesus, as I mentioned, to this very day, is a cause of division. Who is he? Is he the Christ or something else? On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he is the Christ. Others, still others asked, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated and we'll continue with our next hymn. Please stand. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him.
Christ the Lord. Our text for this, the second week after Christmas, is our gospel lesson. It's very short. I'd like to read it again. It's found in John chapter 7, verses 40 to 43. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said he is the Christ. Still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. So far God's word, you may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, there are certain subjects that if discussed today, they do not unite people, they divide. Politics, of course, is one of those subjects. Very rarely will people who are on the opposite ends of the political spectrum agree on anything. Anything, whether that is health care, the economy, national defense, or the environment, it is simply not going to happen. Another divisive subject may be the coronavirus. Some people see the virus as something to be feared, others not. Another is religion. And this is interesting. That's because people of opposing faiths and denominations all believe their religion or denomination to be correct. And they further believe that all others except their own have some kind of flaw or error in it that is to be avoided at all costs. Every one. And of course, there are a number, uh, a number of other subjects of which people just cannot come to an agreement on, and it ends up just an endless source of debate. For example, which is the better fast food chain? Is it McDonald's, Burger King, Culver's, or something else? Which is better, cable or direct TV? Which is better, iPhone or Android? Mac or PC? Who makes a better truck? Ford or Chevy? Or how about this one? Packers or Bears? Well, I suppose that really depends upon where you grew up. You know, I read an article recently that stated that the only thing Americans can really agree upon, and this is based upon a recent survey, is that 80% of Americans agree that our country is divided. Can you believe that? The only thing we can agree on is that we are divided. If that wasn't so sad, I'd probably find that to be pretty funny. Our scripture lesson for today speaks to a divisive subject, and definitely it is not funny. Jesus was and remains a subject of debate. Is he the long-promised Messiah? Was he just a prophet, or was he nothing at all? Was he some kind of fraud masquerading as someone else? And now here we are some 2,000 years later, and nothing has changed. Christ divides. Is he or isn't he? We need your answer and more. We are all, I believe, still dealing in the afterglow of Christmas. The decorations outdoors still twinkle, especially at night. Many Christmas trees still stand the images of children opening up Christmas presents still leave us with that warm feeling inside. Christmas is probably the most anticipated season of the year. Everybody loves Christmas, family, tradition, presents, and of course, you've got all those angels filling the night sky, startling the shepherds as they announce the Savior's birth. And then you have the scene at the stable, a mother, a father, a little baby, wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And then there's that story about the wise men 
and the star that guided them. We all love Christmas. We all love to hear that story of Christmas again and again. The Savior of the world has been born. However, let us not lose sight of the reason he came. The Christ child came to carry out his father's plan of salvation, which eventually involved his suffering, death, and resurrection in payment for your sins and mine, for the sins of the entire world. The afterglow of Christmas must now meet reality. You know, the scriptures, they do share quite a bit of information about Jesus' birth, but not much after that. We know that Mary and Joseph, they fled to Egypt to flee from Herod's evil plans. We know that eventually they returned to Nazareth and they settled there. But then we don't hear about Jesus again until he's 12 years old and how his parents found him in the temple courts carrying out his father's business. And then we don't hear about Jesus again until he is baptized by John in the Jordan River and officially begins the work that he was sent here to do. So from this manger in Bethlehem, we fast forward now 30 years. Jesus is on the scene. Large crowds of people have begun to gather around to listen to him preach and to teach, mesmerized by his ability to heal people and to feed thousands with next to nothing and his ability to calm both the wind and the waves. As our text now begins, Jesus has come to the city of Jerusalem to participate in the Feast of Tabernacles, which is really the celebrating, the bringing in of the harvest, but also it is meant to commemorate how God cared for his Old Testament people as they wandered in the wilderness for the 40 years. And we're told that about halfway through this festival, Jesus went into the temple courts and he began to preach and to teach. And immediately the people recognized Jesus as someone who spoke with great authority. And then Jesus said this, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? Jesus is identifying himself as the source of life and faith. He is the promised Messiah. So in other words, once the Holy Spirit works the miracle of faith in you, you will now finally begin to see me for who I really am. Who talks like that? And then our text goes on. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is a prophet. Others said he is the Christ. Still others ask, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Is he or isn't he the Christ? Is this the guy we've been waiting for all these years or not? Some people thought Jesus might actually be a prophet. He actually spoke with great knowledge, with great authority as someone who is actually sent from God. Others believed. They said he is the Christ, but still others refused. And they refused to believe because they based that on what we heard in the first lesson, that prophecy from Micah who said that the promised Messiah was going to come from the family of David, that the promised Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem, and they already knew that this Jesus guy came from Nazareth, so it couldn't be him. Isn't that amazing? They have the Messiah right there in front of them. And they still don't see him. They still don't see him for who he was. Jesus spoke as if he was from God. He said things that God would know. He did things only God could know. And only God could do. And he also then claimed to be the source of life and of faith. He did all of these different things. He performed all of these miracles. So where were the people then? How did they miss him? Why didn't they ask where Jesus was born? Why didn't the people dig just a little bit deeper? Why didn't they come and find out? Why didn't they just ask? Why didn't they press the issue? Why did they refuse to believe? 
And I can only conclude that the reason why the people refused to believe is because Jesus did not fit their preconceived notions of what the promised Messiah was going to be. They wanted some mighty warrior, someone who was going to restore the kingdom of Israel to its former position of power and prominence, not some no-name guy who hailed from Nazareth. As a result, the people were divided. And you know what? They still are today. For many, the concept of God sending his son to earth to become human so that he might die for the very people he created makes no sense whatsoever. Absolutely no sense. And so they refuse to believe. And others say that they only want to believe in what they can see or in what they know and what they can see with their own eyes. And since they have never seen God, they don't believe he exists. And so they would rather put their trust in themselves or in other people because people they can see. Others put their trust in science. They want facts. And they believe that science produces the facts that explains where we come from and where we're going. The Christ child still divides. Not long ago, a prominent football player voiced an opinion which is shared by many of the people in the world today. This is what he said. I don't know how you can believe in a God who wants to condemn most of the planet to a fiery hell. Of course, the truth is God does not want to condemn most of the world to a fiery place in hell. Just the opposite. God wants everyone to be saved. That's why he sent the Christ child. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to save the entire world. And so if this individual had only done just a little bit more digging, he would have found out that the entire world deserves to spend their eternity in hell. We're all sinful human beings. We all fall short of the glory of God. And the only reason why some people are condemned to spend an eternity in hell is because they have refused to believe in Jesus as the Christ. They have refused to believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, not because God doesn't love them. The Christ child still divides. Not long ago, a prominent comedian attempted to defend his atheistic beliefs by stating that religion and thereby belief in God is nothing more than a good babysitter meant to get a desired behavior. In other words, religion is meant to keep people in line. Nothing more, nothing less. The Christ child still divides. About this time of year, it seems that we're always having that debate about how we're supposed to greet one another at this time of year. Are we supposed to say Merry Christmas, or are we supposed to say Happy Holidays? And I'm told that the politically correct answer is supposed to say, we're supposed to say Happy Holidays more than Merry Christmas because we would not want to offend anyone who doesn't believe in Christ. So the politically correct answer is to take the Christ out of Christmas. About a year ago, an article was written which stated that this debate between Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays serves as a badge of group identification driven by differences in ideology based upon age, geography, and gender. Has it really come to that? The Christ child still divides. Where do you stand? We need your answer now and more. Lord willing, those who listen to, watch, or read this message today will also now form a badge of group identification. We know Jesus to be the Christ. We know who he is, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. We know where he came from. He came from heaven to earth. We know where he was born in the town of Bethlehem. We know where he was raised in Nazareth. We know where he worked in Galilee and Judea. We know where he is now. He's in heaven. We know why he came, to save us from our sins, and we also know that one day he's going to come again. We have these answers because by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit has opened up our hearts and minds and led us to believe. 
Somewhere, someone along the way has walked you through all of these misconceptions and focused you on what is the truth. Maybe that someone was a parent who had you come to our elementary school or our Sunday school. Maybe that's something that you learned at a grandmother's knee, or maybe that's something you learned from a pastor. Whatever it was, someone cared enough to share with you the truth. So now what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do about it? Everybody here knows of someone who does not have that same confidence, that same faith as you. Everybody here knows of someone who is struggling. Maybe they don't see God's work in their lives, and so their life is just an absolute mess. Or maybe you know of someone who believes their life is going so great right now, they don't have time for God. At least not now. This is where you commit. You know the truth. You know who Jesus is. You know he is the anointed one, the one sent by God the Father to carry out his plan of salvation. The Holy Spirit has led you to believe, and now it's up to you and me to share with other people what we know to be true. This is why we, hear, we are here. We have come together and are to be found working together striving to carry out that same purpose so that more and more people now learn the truth of who the, who the Christ child really is. The Christ child is more than just a baby lying in a manger. He is your Savior and mine. Speak to that truth. Hold it dear. And then remember to share it whenever and wherever you can. And we pray that God might bless our efforts. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the news of our Savior's birth fill us with boldness today and every day. Amen. We now have an opportunity to confess our Christian faith and we do so together using the words of the Nicene Creed. We say together, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
Please stand now for the prayers. This evening in our prayers, we include the family of Ron Banky, the husband of Sharon Banky, and father to Chris Banky, who was called home to heaven this past week. Funeral services will be held here on Saturday. Let us pray. Lord God in heaven above, in these days after Christmas, may we continue to find our comfort and joy in knowing that you came into this world as a tiny baby, but grew, to be up, grew up to be our mighty warrior. You stood up to sin and death and the devil and conquered them all. You gave your life in payment for our sins so that all those who believe in you have the confidence of sins forgiven and the hope of everlasting life. Lord, we ask that you now use us to share with others the true meaning of Christmas. Empower us to share the good news as the shepherds once did. And enable us to share with those we love and those we meet what we know to be true. That you, Lord, are the Savior of all. We ask this in your name. Lord, it is with heavy hearts that we come before your throne and ask that you be with the family of Ron Banke. Give them comfort, give them peace. Lead them to see even more why Christmas is so important. Enable them to hang on to the knowledge that the Christ child came and gave his life in payment for Ron's sins. And that as we speak, the faith created in him has led his soul to be with you and all the saints and angels in eternity without pain or sorrow or sin. Lead us to rejoice that another saint has made it safely home. We bring all these requests now before your throne as together we join to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. 